on this part of the world, the other side of the Mississippi, I suppose, being in St. Paul, I hardly ever do this uh, very parochial, uh, a little nervous here, but, uh, the other side of the world. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure that all of you have come out. I'm really appreciative of that. Um, this, I'm going to just talk about the book I just wrote, and I'm going to try to make some sense of what I did uh, to you. Uh, I'm going to give you the plan for the book and what I think are some of the conclusions that one can reach based on what I did. And um, I'd like to say from the start that the book is that a book, as you'll see, of case studies. And I, I, my main purpose was to um, tell stories about companies uh, who were similar in many respects and might be considered competitors. Sometimes, uh, in, in a lot of instances, I was telling, telling stories about uh, venture capital, which is uh, private equity, which is not what we, we ordinarily think of as a company. We think of them uh, in a slightly different category. I think most of them when we think about companies, we think about publicly traded companies. But I have some stories about them. So my aim was to tell these stories, to create cases that I could use in my teaching, that others could use in their teaching, and to bring us up to date on these stories. And um, I don't reach a lot of com big picture conclusions in the book, nor do I use very much academic jargon of any kind. Um, to the, probably the dismay of my colleagues if they would read it, but uh, it's very journalistic in nature, so I do um, recommend, if you're just interested in these companies and what's happened with them and where they've gone, I've dug up, dug up a lot of interesting uh, uh, parts of their stories, so uh, I'd love you all to buy it on Amazon <laughs> or use it in your courses. So, what was my motivation? This is a little bit of a retrospective motivation. So, in 2006, um, two books appeared with contradictory theses, thesa, if you will, about uh, the world. There was one book, that, and they were both through a very important landmark uh, publication. One book by Estes and Winston, which was called um, uh, Greed to gold, and the argument was that there was lots of money to be made if companies became more sustainable. And they said, yes, there are obstacles, and they listed in uh, on one page in the book, and they developed some of this, some of the important obstacles, uh, misunderstanding of markets and customers, companies expecting a price premium when they sold something that was sustainable, the inertia within the companies, their inability to move in this direction. Um, their, that their claims were outpacing actually what they were doing and that that posed a threat to them as well because people would discover that what they were doing was not exactly what they were claiming that they were doing and an inability for them to tell the story. But they were of the strong opinion that all of these obstacles could be overcome and then in the end there was no real problem. Uh, David Vogel, who teaches at the uh, University of California, Berkeley, at the Haas School, who wrote the foreword to my book. It's, it's a brilliant foreword. It might be even more brilliant than the book itself. And he, um, he wrote another book called The Market for Virtue, and he disputed basically these claims. And he said that this, the marketplace itself as a motivating force which would introduce more sustainable practices on the part of businesses, in other words, the attraction for profits and financial gain had, was very limited in its capacity to do this. And he was, just as I'm trained actually, originally as a political scientist, he's trained as a political scientist, and his argument, not surprisingly, was that without government regulation, none of this will occur, none of it will take place. And you need a lot more than just the motivation of profit to bring about more sustainable practices on the part of businesses. You need the strong, forceful, consistent hand of the government to make it happen. So uh, that was kind of the context of uh, the book that I wrote and some of the questions I was trying to answer. So this is a cover page of, of the book. And um, what I wanted to do this is like nine years after those books appear. 
And my rationale or motivation was to see what had happened subsequently in those nine years in this sustainability journal journey with respect to uh, major companies, pairs of companies that you could think of as competitors, pairs of a lot of these uh, instances, or a few instances really, I was looking at venture capital in particular, and I was trying to look at the whole stage of uh, kind of business development. And so I'm going to go through the chapters, the books, in the book, and, and the companies I covered, and kind of the rationale for why I covered them. And then I'm going to, uh, in the end, give you a few conclusions that really aren't in the book directly, as I thought about this, okay. So here, I, so I, I, the way I organize the book is I organize it in terms of what I would call stages in the sustainable journey. So in the, in the first five chapters are, are about fuel, and the last three chapters are about food. And there is a rationale for why I organized it in that fashion. Um, so, it, with regard to this journey, the way I was thinking about the journey was kind of like the funding of startups all the way up to companies becoming mainstream and delivering sustainable products, or at least uh, alleging to deliver sustainable products. Mainstream companies like a, a Whole Foods, for example, or even a Walmart. My last case study is Whole Foods and Walmart, which are uh, contesting the supermarket to the uh, in the market for <coughs> sustainability. And, and, and one of the things I did discover actually is that Walmart has a, a, is delivering to all of us a, a high number of um, organic food options, it's surprisingly much lower prices than Whole Foods. Now, probably, you know, if you walk into a Walmart, you wouldn't be aware of that, but there's kind of a, a I, I call that chapter convergent capitalism that there's a consensus capitalism that all companies today have to make some kind of effort in, in this direction. But I start with uh, startups. I'm very interested in startups, innovation, and I wanted to look at clean energy. I call it clean energy in the book, and, and subsequently I think I should have titled this, and I, I've just written an article actually for California Management Re Review. It's being reviewed. So, uh, California Management Journal, so it hasn't been accepted yet, but I, I, I refer to it now as cleaner energy, and I think that's a more appropriate term than clean energy, because there's no such thing as clean energy. So, uh, you'll excuse my use of that phrase throughout this. So, initially, there's, in, in like, a, the stage of the journey, and this is occurring simultaneously, you know, right now, but initially in the stage of the journey, you're getting startups that are being funded, they're experimenting with new concepts, and I'm going to focus a lot on this today. And in this startup stage, uh, it's very, very competitive, it's very brutal. Uh, at very few of these firms actually survive, and many of them are going to fail completely. And I'll show you that as I go through this. So my case comparisons, the, the, the organizations on which I focus, there's a chapter on uh, private equity venture capital funding of cleaner energy. And the biggest two funders, according to the sources that I was using, are Kozla Ventures and KPCB. You may or may not be familiar with these two uh, venture capital companies. KPCB has been in the news a lot lately because of a particular issue having to do with an employee. But, uh, and Kozla Ventures was actually started by a KPCB, ex-employee at KPCB. Uh, he was one of the founders of, uh, his name is Kozla, and he was one of the founders of Sun Microsystem. And the other major corporate, corporate venture capital, which is slightly different than private equity venture capital, private equity venture capital involves institutions, endowments, wealthy individuals handing over their money to venture capitalists to uh, fund startups. Uh, they, they take on an ownership interest and they, they become heavily involved in the management. KPCB is one of the uh, most uh, illustrious uh, legendary uh, venture capitalists in the United States. They, they funded companies like Amazon, other companies that, that we all know about today that have become very, very famous. And um, so, and, and, and corporate venture capital is slightly different. It has different uh, and, uh, motivations. Oftentimes it's just because corporations, the way the corporation can do innovation, it can learn about new technologies. There's a little bit less pressure in, in corporate venture capital because the motives for becoming involved in it are much more mixed. There's a little bit less pressure 
for them to succeed, to have the big wins. All of venture capital in general has very few wins. You, nobody actually has seen a, a, a good statistic on this, but we might think that of, of 100 investments they make in startups, only one will succeed, and that will justify all the other 100. Maybe <coughs> 9 or 10 will... Uh, <laughs> Nine or ten will not lose money, but there are many, many losses uh, uh, in comparison to gains. And the two major ways that uh, private equity venture capital is looking for making money is if the, there's an IPO so that the firm goes public and is offered on, on the stock market. That's, that's a major way for them to, uh, to close out one of these investments in a successful way. And the other major way is if the company is acquired by another major company. So in either case, there's a big infusion of cash to both the venture capitalists, which captures 20% of that, into their investors who capture the rest. They capture about 2% for any company in the interim that, that they're managing. The corporate venture capital has a slightly different motivation, and the two companies I looked at intensively were Intel Capital and Google Ventures. Again, the justification being is that they, according to the database that I was using, they are the uh, heaviest investors in cleaner energy uh, of any corporate venture capital that's out there. Intel has a long history in this area. Uh, Google is more recent and used slightly different uh, uh, criteria in making its investments. They actually uh, created an algorithm. They tried to do it in a much more systematic way. So uh, that, that was the beginning. So I'm following these stages in the sustainable journey. So I start with funding, and then I look at business model testing. So I take some of the firms that have been funded. I took some solar firms and some electric car companies, and I compared their efforts in the early stage. This is after all these companies actually went, uh, had IPOs except for Better Place. Better Place, which is an Israeli, basically an electric car startup uh, space. Uh, Better Place, uh, they never got funding, but it had never actually had an IPO, but had received from venture capitalists almost a billion dollars in funding before it failed. So think about that, the amount of money that went into this company before it failed. Um, so in this early stage, the companies are trying to build their businesses, they struggle, some continue on, some succeed beyond expectation, and some fail. So the solar companies I looked at, First Solar is an American company, uh, it's funded, actually, heavily started by the Walton family. It's another interesting connection between Walmart. I, I told you there's a lot of interesting facts that I picked up in doing this, this work. And uh, SunTech is a Chinese company. And, and at one time, it was the largest Chinese company in solar energy. Sin Chinese companies, both in wind and solar, grew enormous in size and revenue businesses very, very quickly. And I would, my criticism of them would be that they entered this space before the technology was mature, with less mature technologies, and as a consequence, they drove out a lot of more interesting companies. And when the European subsidies went away, because a lot of their, a lot of their efforts were, were directed towards selling in Europe, the European subsidies went away. Many of these. Chinese companies were very hard hit and, and experienced huge difficulties, including the one I looked at, SunTech, which was one time was the largest of these Chinese companies, and basically also went bankrupt, but was saved by the city where it is located because there were 10,000 jobs involved. It's harder, I would say, for Chinese companies to go bankrupt than U.S. companies or Israeli companies. I mean, uh, Petter Place could have been saved by the Israeli government, which decided not to, which uh, I think is also very, very interesting. And Tesla, of all the companies I looked at, Tesla is probably the most successful. Now, we could also have a very long discussion about whether Tesla is really sustainable. I mean, if you think of sustainability as resting on three legs, you know, it's, it's not only good for the environment, but it, there's also a social component to it. I'm sure that uh, probably no one in the audience here is of the social class that can easily afford a Tesla. So I think that that part of the Tesla story can be questioned, certainly. But as a success on, on Wall Street, I mean, even I can show you uh, with regard to their bottom line, even though they're not making a profit, the main reason they're not making a profit, their gross margins are very, very high. 
the reason why they're not making their net margins are, are negative is because they're pouring so much money into R and D. So it's, that's another interesting part of that story. So then the next uh, part of the journey that I looked at, still on fuel, is I was looking at more established companies, Toyota and GM, Investus and GE, again looking at hybrid vehicles and wind, continuing the examination of uh, cleaner energy. And I was looking at established companies coping with macro environmental and industry shifts, which were threatening to them. And, um, and, and so what I saw in both these instances of these companies were these firms were discovering new obstacles as they went along to their initial successes. So an example of uh, the new obstacles would be, the, and all these companies really face this, the anticipation was, I mean these obstacles were amazing <laughs> environment, but the anticipation clearly was, for example, in the venture capitalists when these companies started, was that uh, the price of petroleum was going to go in that direction rather than in that direction. Um, there was a very large anticipation and expectation that the U.S. would pass carbon, some kind of carbon control legislation, which never took place. There was very little anticipation that we would have a huge financial crisis in 2000 and 2008. All of these things uh, hurt the development uh, of these companies. So I looked at hybrid vehicles and I looked at Vestas and GE in the wind space. Uh, GE's holdings in wind, another you know kind of little factoid that, that I think is very fascinating. GE bought Enron's old, that's how GE got into the wind business. These are Enron's old wind holdings. And GE is a major player in wind. At one point in time, I, I don't think their revenue is at this level right now, but at one point in time, they were earning like six to seven billion dollars in revenue out of their wind, uh, out of their wind uh, investments per year, which is a, you know not insignificant when we think about that. That's a Fortune 500 company in and of itself. Investus is, is a Danish company, the oldest, most well established, dedicated completely to wind. And here, the macro forces, that, and, and I'll show you an example of this. The, the wind energy in particular is heavily affected by the granting and the taking away of subsidies. Um, and especially in the United States. And you can never be assured that the subsidies uh, are there. And, and, you, and I'll show you a, a, a graph later on, a chart, which shows you know, wind investment goes like this and it follows pretty much the, the way subsidies go in the United States. And that's a very, very hard way to conduct business uh, for any company. Uh, another issue with wind, particularly in Europe, and particularly in Denmark, which is heavily dependent upon wind right now, I think it's something like 25%, 35% of its power is wind generated, is they've just run, run out of land space for good wind. And, and that's, that's a problem in general. And offshore is much more, uh, much more challenging than onshore wind. Now, that problem also really exists, and, and I think people are not generally aware of this, that problem also exists in the United States because usually the best sites for wind are the ones that are first cultivated or planted, if you want to use a, a strange type of analogy. And so the sites that we're using now uh, to develop wind energy are not the absolute best sites from the perspective, there are really a couple perspectives, but how much wind is, is, is on the site and also the ability to, to to actually obtain rights to use that site for wind generation. So as a consequence, there's this like the technology has to get better as the, the, the availability of the sites go down. And the technology has to improve. Now, Vestas is is has had ongone through incredibly difficult financial times as well. Uh, they are they are in terms of their technology, they're the most advanced company I would say in the world, early pioneers in the area of wind technology. But again, Chinese companies Dozens of them started um, to cover China. China has built a tremendous amount of wind generation. A lot of it not connected, at least, at least initially. I, I think they've tried more because it surrounds China. It's not near. It's, it's the same problem we have in Minnesota. It's or the same problem you have everywhere in the United States. It's not near where the power is needed. And so you have to build transmission, which is oftentimes a cost which is not connected to, to wind. So the, these are some of the issues coping with mass environment and industry shifts in companies that are more mature and, and established. Then we then I switch to food. Now, um, I think there's a rationale for my switching to food besides the fact that I was interested in both areas from clean er energy because I think in general, in terms of moving towards the mainstream, 
I think that um, healthier food is more advanced and more closer to the mainstream than um, cleaner energy. If you, there are a lot of indicators, but I think there have been shifts. There's been shifts in the United States uh, with regard to healthier food. It's still at the margin, but I think there are shifts going on, and it's more significant than the shifts towards cleaner energy. And of course, you know, you can, you can say that there's some obvious reasons because uh, healthier food affects people's bodies. It's more immediate. It's more. It's closer to uh, to, to what we care about. And cleaner energy seems more distant in the sense that we're doing it for uh, the purposes of future generations. Um, but in any case, so I look at uh, three pairs of companies in the, in the food industry, the food value chain. And um, with regard to food, uh, I looked at, uh, at issues. So I looked at General Mills and Kellogg's and Pepsi and Coke. And these are all established companies where um, if you uh, uh, look at the kind of critique that they've been under, it's been a, uh, a constant critique of them making us more obese. And the obesity problem in the United States is totally out of control. When, when uh, roughly 33% of Americans are overweight, 33% of Americans are obese. You know, obese, not overweight. So 67% of Americans, roughly, are either overweight or obese. But that doesn't leave many people less, because we're also talking about the babies. You know, I don't know how they weigh babies exactly, but um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, and, 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 and one of the most amazing factoids, again, that I came across in doing this, there was a study done in about 2002 by an international agency, which says of the seven, roughly seven billion people in the world today, 1.2 billion are undernourished and 1.2 billion are overweight or obese. It's in exactly the same number. So these two companies, uh, these, these two sets of companies, they, they, they should, so when I talk about General Mills and Kellogg's, I'm really talking about sugary cereals. And when I talk about Pepsi and Coke, I'm talking about carbonated soft drinks, which are also made with massive amounts of corn syrup. And, uh, and both of them are under heavy challenge for doing that. We know uh, Mayor Bloomberg and, and, and the general critique. But what's even more important from a business perspective, the, that kind of critique is actually having an impact on these companies, especially in the United States. So if you look at their revenue with regard to sugary cereals, there are a lot of reasons. It's not just because of obesity, because people, people the convenience of eating cereals, etc. But the, those products are declining in sales. And, and they're declining, you know, pretty steeply in sales. So the issue that both Coke and Pepsi and um, General Mills and, and Kellogg's face, from a purely business perspective, they face this issue of what do they invest in to regain these lost sales. And, you know, these, these are serious issues. If you're an investor and if you look at General Mills or Kellogg's, and if you put your money in those companies very recently, you haven't got much of a return. But both of these companies are really struggling to, 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 to make decisions about their future. So their question, the question could be, should they invest more in advertising to hook young kids on sugary cereals? That's one option. Or should they invest in, quote, and again, I, I think we, I shouldn't call this healthy foods, but healthier foods. And, and they both uh, have a uh, Acquired General Mills and Kellogg's did acquire other companies that uh, General Kellogg's acquired um, Kashi, and uh, which they didn't manage very well. <laughs> and uh, uh, and Kel uh, General excuse me Kellogg's acquired Kashi, and General Mills has acquired had made a variety of Cascadian Farms, and they made recently another uh, acquisition in this particular area. But then there's this question about the corporate: where are they going to put? their money, where are they going to invest, where are they going to invest their identity, their corporate resources into the future? Which side of the business is going to, going to get more of the investment? So that's kind of the question I was dealing with here. And, and of course, there's this, all this issue of advertising, too, which, which is, there's been incredible amounts of suits filed against both General Mills and Kellogg's for false advertising and making false claims, both about their sugary cereals not being bad for your health and about the health claims about their so-called healthier options, their healthier choices, really living up to the, to the claims that they're, they're making for them. And so if you, um, and so the next 
a group of companies, and this is the last two cases I looked at, and this was the mainstream, moving it to the mainstream. So I was looking at, um, in this case, in, 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 and I know some of you may sound, make, this one sounds a little bit odd, but it, it is a little bit odd. But I was looking at companies that are devoted to, entirely to what I would say is a sustainable goal as opposed to being more diversified. So the parallel that I was drawing here is, this is one I, I think I'll get frowns from everyone in this room. Can I put Monsanto, if you believe the claims that Monsanto is making, we're going to feed the planet, et cetera, with GMO uh, seeds. And, and Monsanto itself is, is retreating a little bit from GMOs to more towards precision agriculture, turbocharged uh, 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 modifications of seeds, and, and so on. So Monsanto. And DuPont, DuPont is a diversified company. That's not all they do, but DuPont is, is actually, if you look at revenue, DuPont in, in the GMO area space, GMO seed area, agricultural productivity area, if you look at actual revenue, DuPont and Monsanto are, are exactly the same. The only difference, they're both, they're both in Syngenta, they're all about $14 billion companies in terms of annual revenue. And if you look, the reason why DuPont is, is not put in that category is it's a diversified company and it has another roughly 12, 13 billion dollars revenue in, 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 in a whole host of other businesses. And if you actually go to the DuPont uh, website, and I, I, I developed a lot of respect for DuPont after doing this, because DuPont really, and every business that it's in, is trying at least to shift to something that's more sustainable, whether it's cleaner energy, they're also involved in cleaner energy, uh, they have biofuels, they're heavily involved in biofuels, biofuel plants, etc. And um, so, but they're more diversified than Monsanto. And the same kind of parallel I was trying to draw between Walmart, which sells everything to everybody throughout the world, versus Whole Foods, which is trying to capture that it's, it's mission based, uh, capturing the healthier food um, part of the business. Now, if you want to really read all the exciting dirt in in my chapter, you don't already know it. There's a lot of exciting dirt about Whole Foods that you can find out by reading my book. Um, and I, I lost a lot of respect for Whole Foods. I must admit, I would still uh, uh, shop in Whole Foods. The way they grew, the way they, they threw, a lot of co-ops were destroyed by their coming into businesses. They, they were an aggressive acquirer. The CEO's uh, political and social views are not ones that I share. They are as equally as bad towards unions. They've busted as many unions as Walmart has busted. You can go on and on. I, I once talked, I was once at a conference, and I, I, said, I started going on and on about Whole Foods, and somebody was so disgusted, you know, she just walked out. I just met the person because she was so dedicated to Whole Foods. She thought I was some kind of, you know, Rush Limbaugh figure. She was not American, you know, from the United States. But, um, but you, I, I think it's very important for us to look at all of these claims extremely carefully. And if you look at Walmart, you know, I, I cannot excuse their labor policies. I don't think anybody can excuse their labor policies. With regard to the environment, their efforts to clean up their supply chain, and they really made, and, and, and if you, this is one, one important issue, difference between Walmart and Whole Foods. Whole Foods does, has no goals with regard to reducing its carbon emissions. Walmart has goals. They're a big user of cleaner energy in their, in their facilities. And they tried, they failed, and, and I think that's true, they tried to clean up their supply chain in, in China. What they discovered is that, I mean, if you think about the world's GDP, and, 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 and you could check me on these figures, and I think that you may be making this one up, but something like 25% of the world's GDP is really passing through Walmart. It's a huge amount of the world's GDP. So the issue with Walmart is when they went and tried to clean up their supply chain and went into China, they said, okay, supplier, here's our criteria, here's what you have to do. But the problem was that that supplier had 20 other suppliers, and they had 20 other suppliers. So they couldn't really get the whole supply chain under control. And even their suppliers, they would give, they'd give different signals. They said, we want you to lower costs, we want you to reduce your energy use. For the supplier to reduce their energy use, they have to make an investment that can't lower their costs. So there's, there's a lot of invasion upon the part of the suppliers. But they were, as Walmart does, it uses quantitative goal setting for all of its businesses. And they really made a, a, an effort. And they're still making efforts with regard to their, they're, they're less ambitious, but efforts with regard to their suppliers in the US. And remember, 25%, they have the largest share of grocery share in the United States. 25% of all groceries that are sold in the United States are sold by Walmart. That means that every food company in the United States, that approximately 
of their sales are to Walmart. That's, that is a huge leverage that Walmart has. Walmart could be a better regulator than the federal government in most respects. And, and so their efforts, I think, are very important. And if you actually look at Walmart, they have, they're selling huge amounts of organic um, S, uh, supply, uh, 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 products, but the, and, and they're selling it at about a third of the price, similar products, because Whole Foods sells these products. People, people I don't think, are quite aware of it. The problem with creating a, a supply chain of that magnitude for organic is, is it, if, we, if we wanted to make it, if you, know, if you wanted to say 70 or 60 percent of, I don't know the exact number, but a high percentage of their products are actually organic, it's impossible because the supply chain doesn't exist right now in the United States. To, and that's a whole question. Do we want to create an industrial scale uh, supply chain for organics? And, and do we want Walmart to be behind, to be behind this? So that was the last part I did with regard to food. This is the last case that's in the book. So, so conceptually, so this is where I've been struggling. There is a, an introductory chapter where I do talk about the evolutionary journal and journey. And but I conceptually, I, I, I think that the book is incredibly weak, and it's not my uh, effort to, to really examine this conceptually. I wanted to get the, the data at more. I was being more of a journalist. I, you know, I'm. I'm not a journalist, but I was picking up the facts as I saw them. So but I would say some overall conclusions is that within all these companies, with all these organizations, even the private venture equity, the sustainable investments that they're making are competing with other strategic initiatives that they're making. Um, they face many obstacles. They have to get internal support. A company like General Mills, the organizational politics, I think they have to be incredible about those who say, sustainable, sustainable, sustainable. The others say, defend our existing business, defend our existing business. That kind of struggle, I think, is huge in all these companies. Um, there's external factors that none of these companies can really control, and I've given you a list of some of them, uh, the costs of energy, government, changes in technology, and so on. And, um, and I think that a, a secret that I, I now that I also teach strategy, and I think as a little secret that uh, that all of you should know is that any kind of strategic initiative that a company takes, and there are a lot of them. Like uh, they can change the pricing policy, they can change their product mix, they can change, they can go global, they can do mergers. Any of these initiatives that they take involve risk, and they often fail. Now, so sustainability is really not that different. Sometimes it pays, sometimes it doesn't pay. I can't tell you right now for each particular company, I even can't tell you in aggregate that sustainability makes more sense from a financial perspective than doing a merger or an acquisition. But I can tell you for sure that the empirical literature that we have says that something like conservatively, you know, there are different studies, but at least 70% of mergers and acquisitions fail, right? So if, if, if in sustainability 70% fail, it's not doing any worse than other things that companies can do with their money. So but it, it, it's not doing much. I don't think there's evidence to say it's doing much better. And, and so it's not really pri privilege. If you are running a public company, or even if you're running a, uh, a, 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 a venture capital fund, you have, you have an obligation to the people who invested in, the, in, your, in your organization to produce a return. And, and, and in the end, fortunately, unfortunately, there are people who are running these companies, they make declarations, I think they're sincere declarations, that they are committed to this, that, but it's, they, they have their, their conflicting uh, constraints on the people who are making these decisions. And, and it's not, the sustainability is not really privileged, though our morals would suggest it should be. Right? And, and, and that goes back to this whole issue of maybe government should be more involved. Government has to be involved. But government regulation is oftentimes so, so poorly carried out. I mean, I, 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 this morning, I do this almost every morning. I do my little rants about uh, you know, we, the, um, enter, the uh, efficiency, miles per gallon efficiency of your automobiles. You know, the government, that's, all of that's false that when you buy an automobile because it's, it's the government, the, the car, I, I, have, I have a hybrid. So I know this hybrid, is, the only way could be that, that those numbers can be honest is if, it, if you're driving 55 miles per hour, no traffic, perfect weather, right? Then you're going to get the amount of miles the government says. But how many people, I, don't, I certainly don't drive that way. 
How, and, and I live in Minnesota, so the weather is never perfect, right? So I'm getting about 75% of what the advertised miles per gallon are on my automobile. I wouldn't be aware of it if I, had a, if I didn't have a, a hybrid which tells me. So that the government's re government regulation, even if it's something as simple, an informational regulation such as giving us miles per gallon, it is totally flawed. It's not that I'm anti-government. I'm, I'm really for government. I'm for good government. Good government intervention. It's very hard, of course, in this environment, political environment, to get that kind of good, good regulation. And, and so my argument here is if we rely on markets, there's a selection process in markets. And it's a brutal selection process. And it's a selection process. It's not going to, without government regulation, it's not going to be good good government regulation and social movement pressure from consumers, it's not going to be that much better than uh, any other business initiative. So that's, that's kind of my bottom line. So I'm going to give you this. So I, I, I was trying to apply this evolutionary perspective that comes out of uh, Howard Alders, Alders' work. And, and I, I'm going to quickly give you some of my efforts to apply it. So he talks about um, uh, uh, evolutionary journeys of new business initiatives. And this is, uh, and I would say that the, this, the sustainable uh, journey is not that different than other initiatives. It involves variation, selection, and retention. And I think there's some real scientists in this room, so you know, you understand what I'm talking about. Me this now. What are we talking about? Variation. But, uh, it, it's, it's taking a direct, it's really, it's, it's directly, he's deriving this from uh, the evolution as Darwin would speak about evolution. There's variation, selection, like retention, there's struggle, and there's uh, forces external to the organization that drive the selection process. Uh, uh, there's mistakes, misunderstandings, surprises, and there's contest, struggle to obtain scarce resources, and struggle over capital and or legitimacy. So I'm just going to give some quick examples here. An example of variation. This is a lot of my examples here are going to come from the uh, venture capital space. So I, I could create some nice uh, tables of food that I had available. So I think the main thing to get from this, like looking at COSLA, early stage investments, late stage investments, you can be as a venture capitalist, you can invest in a startup when you're very early stages or much later and more mature stages. So I divided it up in, in, in those terms between KCB and, 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 and COSLA. And you can see that there are differences in in, in, in their investment strategy in that KBCB did a little bit more uh, later de stage deals than COSLA and uh, overall the total number, if you can read all this. And the other thing that I think is very interesting is that both companies, even though uh, KBCB was involved more in energy efficiency and COSLA, he had a great faith in biofuels, which may have been completely stupid, you know, in the long run. But he had great faith in biofuels. He did a lot more biofuel deals than KPCB. But, but overall, what you should get from this is it, it was a, it was a, a variation process. They didn't they didn't like the, the the venture capitalists didn't say, okay, energy efficiency is where the great gains are going to be made. The energy efficiency startups, this is where we should concentrate our money. We should concentrate our money on early stage. No, they were just spreading seeds out there. And almost, it's not entirely random, but it's fairly random because they're, they're sort of everywhere. There's all these different uh, efficiency, solar, transportation, storage, biofuels, wind and ag deals, total numbers, you know, and, and there's some, some difference in early versus late stage, but it's pretty random. So I would call that, that a, a variation process. Uh, and the same thing you could say about the corporate venture capital state with slightly different variation. Again, energy efficiency is very high with income capital, and they put money in advanced materials, which nobody else put money into. And you can see there are differences, but again, the money is being spread pretty widely. Uh, Google Ventures uh, was much heavily, initially at the solar, they actually abandoned that later on, and much heavily into transformation when Google Ventures in the end started investing actually into um, uh, 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 actual production of power, production of wind energy, production of solar energy. And the reason why they did that so heavily is because they depend upon the cloud a, a great deal. And they were being criticized for producing huge amounts of, uh, uh, of carbon uh, emissions. And so they started trying to protect themselves. I mean, a lot of the wind farms are in Iowa, for example, Buffett is, is invested in them, but also Google has a, a lot of investments here here in the Midwest in, in wind farms, and they put their, their cloud resources near those wind farms. 
So that's again, I think this is variation. It's going up, the money's going all over the place without a lot of concentration. And, and then uh, selection. So this is where I was looking at the overall environment. So they have choices. Most of these uh, um, venture capital firms, their background is really not in cleaner energy investment. Their, their, their backbone, where they made their money, made their names, is primarily in the areas of information technology. I'm saying medical technology is secondary. But information technology, I mean quite broadly. I mean telecommunications. I mean a lot of different things. So when I think about this chart, it's very, very interesting. So, and, 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 and I trace this carefully. So if you go back to 2002 to 2003, this is right after the, the burst in the bubble, the high tech bubble. So they're, they are looking for new places to put their money. They don't, and, and indeed in those years, and it's not them, they only, it, Intel and, and, um, and Google and KPCD and uh, COSLA only heavily get involved around here. And these are like specialized venture capital firms. But if you look at this period of time, those, this area of cleaner energy is doing much better than information technology and all these c categories in terms of returns. And so they see this and they say, money. <laughs> this, is a, this is a place to go. And then they become heavily involved. But the feedback from the selection environment, which is the financial environment, all of a sudden it changes about 2004, and information technology comes back. Information technology, 2005, 2006, your traditional area of strength and investment is saying, don't, go, don't cleaner energy is not where you're going to make your money. You're going to make your money in these traditional areas where you've always invested. So again, that's the selection environment which is not favorable. You know, and a huge factor, because this is retrospective with regard to their investments. I mean, I think a huge factor that changed Besides those other factors that I, that I, I, I talked about before, was they all these venture capital companies were betting on the fact that we would have uh, carbon control legislation in the United States. And when that didn't happen, that was a that was a that was a stinker, you know, with regard to this industry. It's the only way I can really describe it. So, and their investment results were not horrible in this area, but they were not great. So here you have COSLA and KPC. So then this is, again, yeah, the selection environment. You see COSLA and KPCB. Uh, COSLA is doing a little bit better on the IPOs, about the same on the acquisitions. Here, Intel is doing better, uh, I think, on the uh, acquisitions. This is the acquisitions in a, a company going public. That's a sign of success. So again, this is about 10% at highest, 14% on the acquisition side here. Um, the, the bankruptcy and out of businesses are less, but there are a lot of companies in general now in the venture capital space that are in limbo. This is un unprecedented. I, I don't know if any of you have been following this, but there's a category of company you can now call Unicorn. Well, what uni Unicorn essentially is, is a company that has been funded by venture capital over time, and they can't go IPO because they're not going to get the perhaps from the stock market, but that's a full valuation of the company. So people keep investing way beyond, the, the typical, in the past, the uh, venture capitalists want to give, give you 10 years to invest. So the, these unicorns are investing way beyond 10, the 10 year period of time. And they see, the valuation seems very, very high. Uh, my son works for one, Spotify, for example, is a, is a unicorn. The valuation seems very high, but many of these companies don't make any money. They have, you know, they're, they're, they're high-tech companies and so on. So, I mean, there are a lot, so if you add up these, these numbers, you know, if public and bankrupt and acquired, you're not going to get to 100%, because there are a lot of companies that are in limbo, sort of in the middle right now in this space. But again, uh, they're doing okay. I, I don't think that they, they, there's no reason for regret. The reason for regret might be that a lot of the companies that go public in the energy the end of cleaner energy space. They they had fair initial IPOs, but after that, this a lot of these companies, the stocks actually tanked. So uh, that's another constraint on their ability to, to bring these companies to a, a successful conclusion. And here's uh, an example of, of this is a very crowded um, slide, but you can see uh, uh, that. Uh, how many solar firms fail? And again, I, I would blame the solar firms' failures. These are 
these are thin film solar firms. We talk about Solentry, the 2011 film. But that started a cascade of other failures among the solar, uh, solar startups. And many of these firms were developing, from my non-tactical perspective, really cool, interesting technologies. And they, because actually the market for solar developed so quickly, they didn't have a chance to mature. That's my, my understanding of, of, of what happened here. Um, and so, and if you also look at wind power, now I think this is also extremely interesting with wind power. If you look at this trend of failure among wind power firms, and you look at it by country, you can see that uh, Germany lost a lot of their wind power companies, the United States lost a lot, Netherlands lost a lot, France, which, which countries in the world do not lose a lot? It's the Chinese. Primarily, and their 18 are still around. They didn't lose them. There's a partial this because they have lower, you know, this is a, 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 a human, uh, very intense human, uh, the labor costs are very, very high, and the Chinese didn't face this difficulty as much. So I'm going I'm to run through this a little bit more quickly, and the time issues going here. And uh, so, and this is an example of the, how erratic uh, wind power is in terms of revenue. Revenue for these companies is heavily dependent upon subsidies, and the subsidies go up and down. And, and you can see this, this isn't just, you know, it, it, a lot of this is backward really, because this is more the great financial crisis. This is subsidy directed as much as, as, as anything else. So it's very, very hard. And then the other thing about it is selection for the selection environment and solar firms. In these trade wars, the, the, the Chinese companies rose very, very rapidly. They were trying to meet the subsidies. The primary market initially in solar. It's not as true in wind. And when the Chinese were building the wind power in China, the, the wind power in China is not close to there. There's a lot of China that's not doesn't have a lot of population. The wind power is not that close to the population. They were not building the transmission. But the solar solar companies, which rose very, very rapidly in China, there were about four or five of them, were over a billion dollar companies in revenues. And then we had this trade war with the United States. The United States essentially uh, restricted the, um, the importation of uh, wind power, uh, solar power uh, modules into the United States from China. And at the same time, they were hit with the end of subsidies in, in, in Europe. And they and they were they were hurt a, a, a great deal. But again, this this kind of the rise of these the Chinese companies. On the one hand, you say that this is very very good because it lowers the costs. And, and the costs of solar. That's the other thing about this. That the costs of solar and of wind not as much, but particularly of solar has gone down. Despite the, the fate of all these companies, has gone down in, in, at a very very high level. And we can. We can say that maybe by the year 2020, with everything involved, that solar easily could be equivalent to uh, fossil fuel generation of electricity. So uh, retention, this is, uh, I'm going to do this very, very quickly. <laughs> so an example of retention, Tesla outperformed GM. And as I said, you know, if you look at the gross margin versus the operating margin, uh, Tesla is actually has very strong uh, gross margin. It's the operating margin. They're pouring a lot of money into R&D. And, and what's really, really interesting, and you see quarterly revenue growth, and this is a, this is a little bit vague, it's, GM has been doing very well recently, but what's really, really interesting, so, so revenue, Tesla is about a company, I think of about three, four, three billion dollars in revenue, it's something like that. And if you look at their market cap, this is GM's revenue is about 100, close to 150, over more than 150 million dollars. If you look at the rev, the, the difference between, this is, Revenue, right? So you expect that the market cap would be would some somehow reflect revenue. GM is is only about a little bit more than twice the market cap of Tesla, which I think is very very interesting. Uh, and so that, this is an example of a retention process. Market using retention. Here's hybrid vehicles. So you see hybrid vehicles. I mean, I, I have a Honda hybrid. I also have a Toyota hybrid. But if you look at this, uh, Honda was involved at the very beginning, but it, the retention here is Toyota. Toyota is the primary growth rate and takes over from almost everybody else in terms of, if this is the total, this is in the United States, and, and this is uh, what is controlled by Toyota. It's almost the only major player. You see later on the Ford comes in, the end does GM, is kind of a failure, although the Volt is a very, very interesting experiment. 
Okay, so this is retention. And, and, and so that, that, that looks kind of good. I mean, if you look at that trend, it's a kind of nice upward trend. There's some dips, and you know, we know that fuel costs, et cetera, are going to uh, affect those dips. But then if you look at the overall percentage sold, now this, this is a very, I could have drawn this differently, you know, the, the, uh, but, but if you look at it overall in terms of all cars that are sold, we are talking about hybrids. We're not talking about anything that advanced, right? I, I should, this audience, I bet you I would get 50% of you are driving hybrids. If I ask the typical MBA class, I get zero. They ask me, what is a hybrid? I know what an SUV is. This is on tape, right? <laughs> I, know, I know what an SUV is. I don't know what a hybrid is. And that's, that's not really true. That, that is exaggeration for the tape for us there. But, um, but you can see the penetration here is only about 3%. And, and hybrids, in, in, in the most recent time, with low fuel costs in the United States in particular, hybrids have been doing very, very poorly in the market, especially compared to uh, SUVs, otherwise known as trucks, for pretending that they're passenger cars, right? So uh, some of you may be driving SUVs, so maybe, maybe I'm wrong. So if you look at healthy foods, yes, so-called, this is from uh, a calorie content rating, so-called General Mills and Kellogg's and Post have introduced some healthy brands, healthier, just healthier brands, but the unhealthy brands still dominate in almost every category uh, as the healthy clean brands. And the amount of money that they're putting into these so-called healthy brands and even the claims that they're making for them, you know, Total or Cheerios, are not always the, the, the strongest overall claim. So again, we see some retention, but we don't see the retention at the level that we really like to see the real take off, the paved with gold idea that we see that I should present at the beginning where you have gigantic take off in this area uh, of sustainability. And there's another example. So where did they, where have both these companies, in particular Kellogg's, they said, okay, we're not going to sell sweet uh, cereals anymore at the same level. So globally, we're going to buy every snack company in the world. And Kellogg's has become a very dominant force in, in salty, fattening, snacks globally. That's their choice. Their choice really has not been to become a, uh, a, a healthy food company. Their choice is to uh, fatten the rest of the world like we can fat, essentially. And so my conclusion is it's not a smooth sailing. It, it doesn't mean that we haven't made progress. You know, I, it, again, the cup half full, half empty, but it's not smooth sailing. We cannot simply rely on the market, the market selection processes to make this happen. We cannot simply rely on government to make this happen, nor can we simply rely on social movements to make this happen. This is a struggle, it's still a struggle going forward. And, and, and that's what I mean by the fitness landscape. The fitness landscape really consists of social movements, governments, and, and um, markets. And they, they select out, and some things are retained. There's variation selection retention. Some things are retained. And the selection process it's not a smooth move, but we are making some progress despite all this. And there's a lot of chance time to land in this and go through institutional bias. So I welcome any questions. I took up probably more time than I will allow for questions. We have a couple of questions. If you please wait for the mic. Thanks for your talk. So, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, I have read yeah. the argument that there's an enormous pool of so-called patient capital or long-term in, um, investment capital, et cetera, that is at least susceptible to being very selective in its investments for ventures that have some kind of sustainability. Do you buy that as a, as a force that could uh, you know, bias things? You made the argument that sustainability was not privileged. Is that a force that could produce it? You know, I mean, people like uh, right now, uh, uh, um, Microsoft, Bill Gates, he's a prominent. I think you'd actually look at the dollar amount, even the dollar amount of a private I didn't look at this carefully, I didn't do any computing, but even the dollar amount of private, private equity venture capital is not enormous. Ultimately, we do need government to invest in the R&D side. And, and the significant breakthroughs, even in IT, if you go back one layer, were not, did not come from private equity, although they played a very important role 
in getting this commercialized. The government, fundamental research on the part of the government is, is critical in this area. Uh, that's my, that my, short, my short answer. It, it can certainly help, but I don't think it's going to be the magnitude. You know, again, I mentioned the Walton family. The Walton family invested. They 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 made a very nice gain from their investments in, in solar power. Um, I, I just there are a lot of people out there, but I just don't think if we added it's very hard to get numbers on. But I think if we added it up, it's still not of the magnitude of the kind of investment we made. That's that's an opinion. That is not really backed by much. Thanks. Yeah. Time for one more. Yeah. Bill Gates said that also. He so made that recently yeah. a comment when he's in his um, clean energy commitments. He says exactly the same thing. In fact, he says that government investment in R and D has a very high rate of return. Yeah. Return and much higher than the private sector in terms of innovation and new technology. Yeah. So the private sector commercializing rather than or that we shouldn't I guess they shouldn't be looking they should overemphasize their role and not in inventing yeah. and underemphasize the importance of government. Of course, you know, a lot of the government investment ultimately is, is contracted out to universities. And, and we have government labs of course who do a lot of this work in fact university but I think we have a role to play here in the university system in making these changes. The thing is, there could be, and I'm always hopeful, that there may be some surprise out there that will take place, which will transform everything. I, mean, I think we're looking for that, that we're hoping for it. And, uh, and that's the reason why, I, I guess, I do believe sort of in, in an evolutionary process, there has to be a lot of variation, a lot of investment. And there may be something that just, because if you look at the steady state um, projections on the part of the DOE in terms of how much of our energy is going to be cleaner by the year 2035, even with all the advancements of most rapidly growing, they're still, they're not saying any much much more than, you know, and they include all kinds of things like biofuels and wind and air, et cetera. They're not saying that it's going to be much more than 15% of the total energy we use in a steady state projection. So that's, that's not going to get us there. <laughs> so we have to find the needle in the haystack. We have to find something that's, that's going to really be totally disruptive. All right. Well, I think um, one more question. One more? I mean, I don't want to make everyone wave.